The title of the message today is Blind, Deaf, and Dumb, Your Choice. Blind, Deaf, and Dumb, Your Choice. I believe it's a very important thing for us to understand and know that God is a good God. God is a very merciful God. God is a very forgiving God. God is a very kind God. He's a very loving person. He's a very beautiful God. He has always helped those in time of trouble. He has always desired to help those in time of trouble. Those, however, it's important to understand who those are. Some of what Tyler preached on last week was speaking about how the servants of God favor the dust of Israel. And that the Bible says that the nations are as the, the isles are as the sands of the sea. They're, they're as the, the, the oceans, as the waters. That it, it's not, they're a very little thing to God. They're, they're counted as a very little thing. That all of the nations are, they're as a drop in a bucket. The Lord doesn't look at, like, look at it as a lot, right? And so th- this is why in the Bible, there's this question, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you would visit him? Is it, I believe it's visit him. Is that correct? I desire to, to have that right. What is man That you would that thou would, would that thou visitest him, yes. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would visit him? And what you don't realize is what you and I have not realized in times past is that God, everything that is in the promises of God is very beautiful. And so what people did in our society, in our time, as you and I were growing up, what they did was they put into all of the devotional books and all of the books and everything that you would read, they took these promises of God and they pulled them out of the Bible and they put them into a collection of books so that you and I would grow up only knowing those promises, only knowing those very things, only knowing, oh, wow, this is so beautiful. This is a beautiful promise from God. This is a beautiful promise from God. I remember having people even say to me, you know, I, you know I, I've had this on my wall for, for, for a year. I've had this one scripture on my wall for a year. It says, behold, I do a new thing and God is doing a new thing in my life. God is saying, now it's gonna spring forth. Now it's gonna happen. Something beautiful is gonna happen. God's gonna do something beautiful. And I believe it's very good to know that God is good. And it's very good to know who God is. But if you know that something is good, you would also have to know who it is good for and who it is good to. Right? If I were to give you some examples of how that works in life, you could say, wow, I really, it was a really good thing that I got this or that I got that, right? I remember, in, you know, you look into society and society itself said, wow, Nike shoes are very good. Good shoe to buy, a quality shoe to own. And then years later, they came in and said, well, all of the people from Nike, from the Nike factory are actually in Indonesia, and a, a, a film crew traveled down there and showed 
the absolute desolation of those people who were actually making those shoes and that they barely made any money at all in the day. They could hardly feed their families and they were showing them cooking from pots that had holes in it. And they showed them in a place where they didn't even have a roof over their heads and when it would rain and when it would get cold, these people would suffer so, de- so, so terribly all to make the pair of shoes that you would spend over $100 on. Now that's a warped mindset because the reality is while Nike is presenting something good to one person, they're actually doing something bad on the other side. Whereas with God, it's the total opposite. God is actually doing something good to those very poor people. It's to the poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are persecuted. See, Jesus, it was like the reverse of what they did. He's saying to the rich, you you say that you are rich and have need of nothing, but you don't realize you're the ones who are poor, blind, naked, and pitiful. It's but unto them that fear my name will the son of righteousness rise with healing in his wings. He's looking after the poor. That's the God that we serve is If he were to be just, if he were to be good, he would be the God who takes the part for those who cannot take a part for themselves. Because a rich man's wealth is like a fortified city to him. He says, look at the things I have. I have so much wealth. I have this city. I have this house. I have these walls and no one's going to penetrate my walls and everything's going to be fine. Right? Right? You've met a rich person in your life and it seems as if they don't have a worry. It seems as if they have nothing to think about. It seems as if their life is full of luxury and every second week they're going off for some golf retreat or they're going off to go and and just lay on the beach and just, just soak up the sun and just say, it's very good. For me, it's very good. But the question is, is it very good for them? Because the Bible says very clearly that that wealth does not profit in the day of wrath. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how fortified your city is. It doesn't matter how fortified your fortress is. It doesn't matter how many walls you have around your home. It doesn't matter how many pieces of barbed wire or electric fence you could put around there. The reality is there would be, if there's iniquity in that house, the wrath of God is going to come through and eat that house up. And James goes as far as saying that the rust the very rust that's on that person's roof of their house is the, is the sign to them. It's, that is their warning. That is their sign. The fact that you have rust on your new car, the fact that your, your wheel well, one of your wheel wells is rusted and you have to go to the store and get a new one and you have to keep replacing that rust is a sign to you. It's gonna end, it's gonna end, it's gonna end. But the Lord is promising those who have not, it's never going to end. It's never going to end. It's never going to (laughs) end. In fact, the Lord says to the Israelites that he caused the shoes on their feet to last them for 40 years. (laughs) Do you understand? Like the Lord is like, it's not just like anti-rust spray the Lord's providing. It's, it doesn't rust. The power of God to say it doesn't rust because I will keep them and I will not cause moth and rust to visit them. Now, I'm not saying that we won't have physical things that rust. I think that's a sign to us all that things fade. Please hear what I'm saying. But when you are not taking joy in that very thing because you bought a car and when it's rusted, you're not worried about it (laughs) because you're like, that's just their car. <laughs> it's just going to rust anyway. Then it does, if we're, there are things that you actually value are not rusting any longer because you didn't have this big value in the car. You didn't spend 60, 80, $200,000 on a car. You just said, I'd like to get from here to there. And I cannot do it on a horse because I don't know how to ride a horse. And so the Lord says, I'm going to provide you with Uh, what's called a modern day chariot. It's called a car. You're going to get that. 
and it's going to have much more horsepower than a single horse, and you're going to be able to go from here to there. And that's the solution that God provides. Now, I'm not saying that every person that has a certain car is not in step with the Lord. I cannot say that. I cannot stand and say that, right? Solomon was very wealthy, and there were certain kinds of chariots that were purchased. I don't judge that matter. I don't necessarily know that matter. I don't say that I will never own that or that someone I know will never own that and that they won't be in the Lord. I don't know the scenario. I don't know the situation, but I do know that if that person is going to put their heart, set their heart upon that those riches and say, this is what makes me me, that that is going to be the error of their soul. And so you have to understand the Bible says that the full soul loathes the honeycomb. When you're full and you've had lots of sugary sweets and you've just had everything that you'd like, you have every dessert that you desire, every delight, every single dessert that you would like, you've had it. And then someone says to you, would you like a honey sandwich? You say, uh, no, thank you. Honey sandwich. I just had a milkshake. Honey sandwich doesn't even sound good. And even if you tasted it, your taste buds are so oversensitized or over, over stimulated that to come down to honey being sweet, would, it would be a demotion. And so where does God place his word? Does he place his word as bitter? Well, to some, the Bible says, that he'll give them the water of affliction. It says that these people will get wormwood, right? And it says that the angel in the book of Revelation, he casts down this rock that makes the waters bitter. And it's called wormwood. So to some, there is a bitter understanding. But David is writing in the Psalms and, and we know this, those who are here, it says that the word of God is like honey upon our lips. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. But why do you believe that they called the proud happy? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And so something that's beautiful to God is a city of people that would take care of the poor. It says that those that gathered much had nothing left over and those that gathered little had no lack. Because God might cause someone to increase a lot and God might cause someone else to not increase. And the question is, how are those people going to live? Well, I'll tell you how society has it. I will tell you how one of the nation, one of the nation's great places, which we would call great in America. Oh, wow. Wow. It's wow. The really prestigious people in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. Do you know that that city has one of the highest homeless Population rates. It is terrible. No one's sharing over there. No one's saying, hey, hey, uh, you, know, you know what? This is what it is. It's, uh, hey, I, I saw you at the stoplight and here's a dollar. That's how people pass off the poverty of this land. That's how people po pass off the poverty of most places. It's, I don't really have the time to bother. I'm at, a, I'm at a traffic light. If you're there, I might give you a dollar. That's it. Maybe at Christmas time, when I'm celebrating paganism, I'll give, I'll give $100 to charity just to make myself feel better from the five to $7,000 that I just spent on Christmas. I might give two or $300 maybe depending. Oh, oh yes, tax time is coming up, so I might as well get that in as well. Let me find some people who might need some money. 
and maybe give them some money. And let me ask my accountant how much, I should, how much I should give so that I could actually make an impact on my actual income, on my taxes. I remember growing up in church and this was something that we had to go hunting for as a church. You know, there's plenty of businesses right now. It's right before tax time. They're ready to give and we should just be, be around so that they can say, oh, you'd like, to, you'd like to have some money? You could have some money. Really? That's what God's people have to resort to. Excuse me, rich man. Excuse me, rich man. Can, can we possibly have a little dribble off of your, your big fountain? And I remember I would look through the church. I would look through mega churches, look through all of them. And I'm like, there's like four to five wealthy people in this church. And it's like a thousand, thousand five hundred. There's like four or five wealthy people here. And you know how that normally works? Well, it's like, it's kind of like a business. In fact, it's not kind of like a business. It's actually gotten better than a business. You know, I'll provide the land and I'll provide those things, but, you know, my my wife and my children, they get to serve at the church on a very high capacity, if you know what I'm saying. Because I did scratch your back by getting you this property and this building. And so you're going to have to scratch my back too. And I remember hearing this story of a, of a gentleman who walked up to a pastor and just put a check on the, on, the, on the table and just slid it up to him and said, how about a three-song service this week? Because I used to sing quite a few songs, just to put a check for $50,000 down on the, on the uh, how about a three-song service this week? I was thankful to hear that the pastor said, how about another church for yourself? And just put it right back at him. I'm glad for that, but how many other bad deals have happened? How many other people have said, I think we can, I think we can organize that? The, and then, you know, here comes the righteous, here comes the righteous excuses. The worship team has really been overworking. So we're just going to take a bit of, you know, just going to do three songs this week. I don't want to overwork. Don't I overdrive anyone, you know. Burnout's a real thing. That's what they do. That's what they do in churches. What's more convenient? What's more convenient for everyone? The more people we have in the door, the more heads we have. I know how, I know how it was calculated. When I was in this church, downtown San Marco, it was calculated for every head that we have in there, how much we were putting a dollar amount on every head. We were saying, this is this, is this, is this. But God is desiring to take care of those who care for his house. God is desiring to take care of those who take care of his house. And so how do you position yourself? How do you position yourself to be one of God's people? Because you might be saying, well, you know, I'm going to try my best. And the reality is, as we, as we read through these chapters of, the, of what we're going to read through today, I desire for you to at least open your eyes, open your ears to understand. If you can understand anything, it would be what I'm about to say to you. It's the first part of what I'm about to say to you. It's an established understanding of what I'm about to say Because without this understanding, you can find yourself in a place of failure. Without this understanding, you can find yourself in a place where you don't know what happened, but it happened to you. And this has to do with God and who he is. Because as much as I'm trying to tell you about the goodness of God and how God is the reverse complete reverse and even better 
then reverse. Complete other world, complete other place than what Nike was doing. Taking from the poor to sell a quality product to the rich. Rather, the Lord is, he's tending to the poor. He's tending to the poor. This message is called Blind, Deaf, Dumb. Your choice. Now, I will say this. Before we start, I'd like to say this. You don't really have a choice. You don't have a choice with what God does. God could sell you off to another nation. God could cause you to lose your life tomorrow. God could cause you to become the president of the United States in five years. You don't really have a choice. The Bible says the hearts of kings are in the hands of the Lord. He turns them whithersoever he will. Turns them about. Whether to do this or whether to do that, the Lord will turn the hearts of kings to do whatever he will. Even if they think they're going against God, they could be going forward towards God. The heart of the Pharaoh was in the Lord's hand. Your heart is in the Lord's hand. My heart is in the Lord's hand. And God can turn us toward him or away from him whenever he will. And so why why are you you saying to us, Ty, blind, deaf, dumb? Your choice. It's not my choice. It's God's choice. The answer is, yes, it's God's choice, but it's actually your choice. But it's actually God's choice. You're saying this doesn't make sense. Whose choice is it, Ty? And I'll say to you that God stands in a place with you, with I, with myself, and with every person on the face of the earth and in a place where he says, do you want to be blind? Do you want to be deaf? Do you want to be dumb? What is your choice? I'll tell you right now, I will go as far as saying this is what the Bible teaches. No answer is an answer. No answer is an answer. Proverbs chapter one says, because you did, you, when I called, you did not answer. Because when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will mock. I will laugh when your calamity comes upon you. This is wisdom. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I just stand at the door of your heart. If any man lets me in, And a lot of people like to look at these Billy Graham crusades by which Billy Graham himself said that he believes that most of the people converted under his ministry were false converts. It's because when you stand in front of a whole crowd and you say, Jesus is just standing at the door patiently, just knocking, 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 knocking. The Bible says no one shall come to God unless the Father draws him. But the Bible says, draw near to God and he will. So interesting. So who's drawing you? Well, God's drawing you near to you, but now you have an instruction. Draw near. Well, not right now. Not right now. You're sitting in your home. There goes the phone. Oh, it's God. I don't think I'm ready to take this call. Put it down. Keep going with your life. Keep going with your life. 
What is the judgment on this? Because what we do believe about God is that he's long suffering. He's patient. He's just going to keep waiting. He's just going to keep waiting. And, you know, it, you know, it would be nice. It would be nice in your life if you just gave a little bit to God. You know, God's so poor. He needs you. He's just going to wait around for you. God's like, please, somebody answer me. Please, I made all of these people just like ants and no one's answering me. Please, would you answer me? Please answer me. Please, you? Okay, I'm feeling hurt. Maybe tomorrow, I'll go to sleep. Is that God? No, that is not God. But somehow in people's minds, somehow in, in your mind, in some way you might have thought of the Lord, maybe I have later, maybe I have later. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 6 to get an understanding of what God says will happen to these people. Now you would say, Ty, surely we, we're in Jeremiah chapter 6 and this is not true. I'm going to show you what Jesus' words are today. I'm going to show you what Paul says today. I'm going to show you what Ezekiel says today, what Isaiah says today. So if Jesus and Paul are not good examples for you, then you should just turn it off right now because you're probably already deaf, dumb, and blind. But Jeremiah is giving us an understanding of what exactly is happening. In the last days, let's go to verse 22. He says, thus says the Lord, behold, say behold, a people come from the north country and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth, and they shall hold they shall lay hold of bow and spear. They are cruel, and they shall have they shall have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. So there's already a people that God raises up against who? Zion, there is a people from the north that are raised up against people inside of the church. They're raised up, right? This is what, what other verses say. They say, for lo, I raise, I raise up the Chaldeans. Where are the Chaldeans from? Babylon. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. Some passages call it a nation of hypocrites. So you don't realize that this, this army, this nation from the north is actually ready to pounce on certain people. And so there are some people who they have no idea that this has happened to them, that they've actually been like this for probably 20 to 40 years in church. They have no idea that they've been stolen and they've been held inside of Jezebel's lair for years. And I'm not saying this as if to say, oh, look, we're out. We're never gonna, we're never gonna be subject to being back in. I'm gonna teach you Something today that if you and I understand, we'll understand that we are never going to be safe from this. The Bible says the man that fears God, the man that pleases God shall escape who? Her. You're not going to escape the grasp of Jezebel. You're not going to escape the whore of Babylon. You're not going to escape those things if you don't understand what it is we're saying today. You're going to actually be, God is actually going to sell you in. He's going to take, let you go. Them that are to the sword, give them to the sword. Them that are to the famine, to the famine. Such as are to the fire, to the fire. God will literally associate you as you have responded to God. God will say, you deserve this. And he'll just put you there for 40 years. You say, that's not God, Ty. You're speaking about, you're speaking so harsh. Let's read the Bible. Let's read what the Bible says. God says, who does he say he's going to, he says, a people come from the north country, a great nation. They're not going to show, they're cruel and they have no mercy. 
Why does God allow them? It says this, we have heard the fame thereof, our hands wax feeble, anguish has taken hold of us, and pain as a woman in travail. Go not forth into the field, nor walk by the way, for the sword of the enemy and the fear is where? On every side. What did Jesus say? Let he that is in the top of a housetop, let him not do what? Come down. This is what this is saying. It's saying, no, don't walk by the way. Don't go into the field. Don't go back. Jesus said, don't even go back to the house to get your things. For the sword of the enemy and fear is on every side. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning. What does James say to the rich man to do? Weep, howl, mourn. As for an only son, most bitter lamentation for the spoiler shall suddenly come up, come upon us. The Lord has left a remnant to hold a place. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous, what? Revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all what? Corrupters. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed with, consumed of what? Fire. The founder melts in what? Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. So it's saying there's people who are founding churches. That's what happened with me. Well, we're just, we're, we're founders. We're church founders. I had a church shirt that said, the city church founder. It literally said the word founder on it. And I was laboring in vain as a founder. And they gave everyone who was on the launch team of that entire church a founder shirt. It wasn't just me and my friend that had the word founder on. It wasn't a company. We made everyone, we called everyone an owner. Everyone was a founder founder, and everyone was doing vain work. It says the founder melts in vain. And here's the reason. For the wicked are not plucked away. The Bible says, God, every morning, God awakens his judgments to us. When we read the Bible, the Lord is telling us, here's what you should do today. You know, this morning, there was something that was happening in our midst. And I opened up the word of God with the children and with with my wife. And right there was the exact thing. It was the exact thing. We began to sing it to the Lord. And we began to glorify his name. And it was as if the Lord was standing with us and he was telling us, go forward. I'm leading you. It's not going to fail. I'm with you. Go forward. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're not going to fear anything. Go forward. Every morning, God has something for you. The Bible says that Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, it says that they offer us everlasting consolation. God desires to console you. He wants to hold you. He wants to say, it's going to be fine. You're going to do well. He wants to say all those things, but here's what people do. They get too busy. They start worshiping the work of their own hands. And then Jesus says, what about time with me? And they say, well, 
you know, I know you're the wife of my youth, but, uh, you know, I got so busy, Lord. I don't really have a lot of time to read the Bible. It says, the wicked are not plucked away. It says, reprobate silver. Say, reprobate silver. Shall men call them because the Lord has done what? So now we're getting into a portion where you will not hear this message in any church that does not teach the Bible. No one is going to stand up on a pulpit or in a particular place on a stage and say, God is going to reject you. God is going to reject you because you didn't listen to him. Now, was, I, the Lord had me watch this particular church that I used to be a part of. I watched their New Year's, just, just like a few minutes of what they said at New Year's. It's the same thing they were saying when I was there almost 20 years ago, almost 10, year, 10 12, 15 years ago. The same message. You know what the message is? What year is it? Oh, it's 2024 coming up. 2024 is going to be your year where God's going to do it. Finally, God's going to do it. I was like, this was last year. You said 2013 was going to be the year. Most people just go through that. And what do they need? They just, they're just looking for some encouragement. Can I have some encouragement, pastor, prophets, anyone? We're blind. We're, we're, we don't, we can't hear anything. Tell us sweet nothings, please. Okay, okay, 2023 is going to be the year. Mark my words. This is going to be the year of God's favor, his blessing, his anointing. Everyone's like, yes, really? You've been saying that for 12 to 14 years. 2007 was supposed to be the year. We made a big banner. It went from one side of the church to the other. And every year the theme was freedom. Reprobate silver. The Bible says, I've chosen them for the furnace of affliction. That furnace of affliction is as if you feel like you're being purified because you're going through trials and tribulations. But God's just saying, okay, you're done on this side. Let's tilt you over because you can't learn anything because you're dumb. You're blind. You're deaf. And so... It's just like they get into the furnace and they just start burning 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 and they just start burning. And then it's like, okay, you burned, but nothing impure came out. You just kept on with your impurity. So this silver just doesn't really just, the dirt doesn't depart from the, from the silver. There's no dross that's coming up to the top. I have nothing to scoop. He just says, just take him from this fire and just put him into that fire. I changed churches. You know what that other church is saying? 2018 is your year. It's like different face, different pastor, just same thing. This one's bigger. This one's got more children's programs. This one's got more of this. This one's got more of that. But no one has the word of the Lord. Because of this. Because God's not going to deny his word. The same Jesus that wrote the New Testament is the same Jesus that caused Jeremiah to write these words down. And Jeremiah will not be put to shame upon what the Lord had him prophesied. Neither will God be put to shame in what he told him to prophesy. This is still true. Because people will not understand why God does the things he does. 
Let's go to Luke chapter 6. Let's hear Jesus' words on this. Luke chapter 6, it's verse 43, it says, For a good tree brings not forth corrupt fruit. Right? Jesus is saying, listen, a good tree doesn't bring, bring forth corrupt fruit. Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. He's saying, don't, don't make, don't make, don't, don't sit there and try to tell me how good your fruit is when the tree's not good. Don't try to tell me that you have bad fruit and you have a good tree. You see, when I was talking earlier about excess, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, you have to understand the reason why the proud are called happy right now is because excess is in. Excess is in, you know, I've got, I've got a pair of Jordans for every single outfit I have. Excess is in. So when they do MTV cribs or some sort of thing like that, and your eyes or someone else's eyes feasts on, wow, look at this successful person. They've got so many pairs of shoes. The mindset goes towards what is success? What is good? And it instantly becomes I need a blue pair of Jordans now. Now I need to have a white pair. I need to have a white and red pair, a white pair for that one shirt. You know that in the past, you've even been in a mindset like that where you're like, there's that one shirt and I don't have a pair of shoes that matches it. Just the fact that you've even had that mindset shows why we call the proud happy. Because it's such a depressing thought to think to yourself that you might only have one or two pair of shoes. <laughs> How's that depressing? <laughs> the Israelites had one and it had to last them for 40 years. How's that depressing? That's like a testimony. It's not depressing to have one pair of shoes. I'm not saying the Lord wouldn't give you more. If the Lord gives you more, it's because there's maybe a purpose for something else. But why would you stand there and say, I only have this, so my life is depressing. (laughs) The only reason why you would be depressed that you only have one pair of shoes is because when you were in Egypt... Listen... If you, were, if you just got born in the wilderness, you never knew a thing. You were just a baby. You just got born in the wilderness. And somebody said to you, I have something for you. It's a pair of shoes. You'd be like, ah, I have a pair of shoes, everyone. Does everybody hear this? Thank the Lord. He gave me a pair. I have a single pair of shoes. You'd be rejoicing, saying, I didn't even know I could have shoes. My feet were getting hot on the, on the, you know, on the sand a little. But now look, I'm just standing here. Thank the Lord. You'd be glorifying God. You'd say, this is the greatest pair of shoes he's provided for me. You'd be dancing before the Lord. I love you, Lord. This is a great pair of shoes. But when excess comes in, when that nation from the north comes in, They're bitter and hasty. And they tell you, look, you've got to get all of this so that your life can matter. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. It's like when we we were on the green and Gigi was sitting right next to me this last week and this young lady just walks right up to Gigi and just says like, look at your hair. And like, just starts going off about Gigi's hair. And Gigi just just started clapping, laughing like, (laughs) ha, ha, ha. Like, 
This is just funny. It's like, this is funny. Like, you think it's about hair. Your idol is on your head. And it's wasting away. All of the value that they put in, they put the value because they call the proud happy because they saw that music video with Beyonce. They've got to look like that. If they don't look like that, then nobody's going to like them. They're not going to get a husband. And so they've got to make some things happen. Well, I mean, I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. Well, you're going to take care of yourself now, aren't you? Why don't you go buy your own house, buy your own things. What do you have again? Oh, you have nothing. So now you're going to go into debt. So that you can get something. I've watched people in my life go into debt so that they could have rims that spin or something like that. I remember back in the day when, when spinning rims was like everything, like people would see that on the road and they'd be like, wow, like it looks like the car's still moving, but it's not like, they used to like be really into that. Like, and I remember thinking to myself, like, it's like, it's like a toy. It's like a toy. And it's like, but you've got those. And there's people taking out loans, taking out loans so that they can have this. Doesn't that just show that the fruit is bad? The tree is bad. The tree is bad. The fruit is bad. It shows us this. And listen to what it says here. For every tree is known but is known by his own what? Fruit. Listen to what it says. For of thorns men do not gather figs. Nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth does what? Speaks. And Jesus, you know, a lot of times people like to stop there and say, wow, that's powerful. Yes, it is powerful. We've gone over this. It's very powerful. But see how exactly, exactly how Jesus just transitions into this next part with the word and. And why? <coughs> Call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. It's interesting. Jesus is talking about as a man is, whatever he is in his heart, his mouth speaks that very thing. He's saying, if you have a good tree, cannot bear bear forth bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear forth good fruit. So he's going to tell them to make the tree good. But while he's saying that, he's saying out of the good treasure of the heart, a man brings forth good things, but out of the evil treasure of the heart. So there's something to be stored, this treasure. There's something being stored. There's something of value being stored inside that person's heart. And it's either evil or it's either good. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? So listen to this. The way that Jesus is saying it right now is he's saying, what, what is inside of your heart is going to come out of you. And he's saying, and why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do the things I say? How are those two things related? How are those two things related? It's because when you have put things of evil treasure in your heart, you don't find yourself bringing forth that good treasure, but you rather bring forth that evil treasure 
And now Jesus is saying, why do you call me this? Why do you call me Lord? And you don't do the things that I'm, that I'm saying to you to do. He's saying it's, it's directly related. He says, whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings, listen to what it says here. And does them, say does them. does them. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, flood arose, the steam, the, 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 the steam beat vehemently upon the house. The stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded, founded, founded. It says, his foundation is in the holy mountains. You see, it says that the earlier chapter that we read, the founder melts in vain. He's making a house. He's making beautiful things. He might have a beautiful home. <clears throat> he's starting these things up. He's saying, I'm going to make a foundation. I'm going to make a church. I'm going to make something. But he's not going to be building it on the rock. He's not going to be building it on the foundation by which he should. But he that hears and, do, uh, and doeth not is like a man without a foundation. Without a foundation. You can work on your house all day long. You can work on your house all day long. You can, you can say how great the message was. You can say how great it is. You could say, wow, Ty, such a powerful message really touched my heart. If you don't have the foundation, you could put all the same pictures up you could, put, you could put the same caulk around the, the windows. You could put everything the same that you would do on the house that had a foundation. On the day when it comes to that flood, on the day when it comes to that stream that beats vehemently upon that house is going to see how much you can hold together. Jesus is talking about the very same thing. Jesus is talking about the very same thing. <clears throat> if you can give me one moment. I don't know if this is in on, on your side or not, but I meant to put Mark 4 in there. You have that? <clears throat> okay, let's go through that. Let's go through Mark chapter 4. Sorry that I... <laughs> did not have that inside of the notes here. We're going to go from verse 24. This is Jesus speaking. And he says, 
It says, and he said unto them, take heed. Say, take heed. What do you hear? You see, the reality of how it starts out is you don't start out. You don't start out in this time. You don't start out blind. The Bible says that on the day of judgment, no man is going to be without an excuse. It reminds me of a young lady that my daughter was desiring to help. She comes from a very desolate family and we came to some decisions. We came to some places where we had to start really asking her whether she desired to serve God or not. What is the, what is the choice? What is your choice? And I remember my daughter standing in the midst of a, of a grocery store with her while we went to go get some groceries. And she just looked at her and she said, you need to delete your Snapchat. And she was like, why? She was like, because the things on there are, are hurting God's heart. There's so many inappropriate things on there. And God doesn't desire for you at your young age to be seeing those things. And not even at your young age, there's things you should never see. And I watched her just like, uh, you know, I'll just, I just, I don't, ha- I don't have that for myself. I just, I, I have my friends on there. And I remember that evening just thinking to myself, Lord, I desire to have grace and mercy on someone. But I'm watching, the Bible says, evil communication corrupts good manners. I'm watching my daughter's mannerisms start to change. I'm watching my, how she's treating her siblings. She's starting to say sentences that the other young lady used to say. And there's starting to be certain things that are starting to be caught on. You understand? And I'm realizing, okay, it says very clearly that we've got to, we've got to test every spirit to see whether it's from God. And so I remember <clears throat> that young lady went home and I, and I spoke to my wife and my daughter that night. And I said, listen, I said, she, this young lady does not desire to serve God. She likes singing songs with us. She even wrote her own songs unto the Lord. She desired to do all these things for God. But the moment when it came to actually doing God's will and putting away evil and eschewing it, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The moment when it came to actually doing that, she was hesitant. And she had already been in this home. She had already been walking around here, being alongside the children for months. It had been months. We weren't, it wasn't like the first day she came. We're like, you've got to change this, this, this. It wasn't like that. We started very slow. Hey, let's sing songs to the Lord. And she was, she was loving that part. She was, she was joyfully accepting it. She was like, wow, like these songs are powerful and let's sing them. And then we wrote songs together. And then, and we did all these beautiful things, this beautiful, 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 beautiful. And then we came to, okay, with the beautiful things, you also have to love God. I do love God. Well, the Bible says you have to hate evil to love God. Ye that fear the Lord, hate evil. Do you fear him? I do fear him. Okay, if you fear him, let's start tackling these things that are, that are, what about, I remember I showed her a a short part of the series, the Hidden Darkness series from the Untamed Truth series. And I, I said to her, look, look at these, Look at Disney, like, look at what they're doing and showed her. And she was like, her face was like, I cannot believe they're doing this. Like, this is wrong. I was like, are you going to do this anymore? She was like, no, no, I'm not. I remember saying like, okay, like maybe there's some good here. Maybe there's something to do. So we just kept on endeavoring and endeavoring and endeavoring. And we got to the place. I remember this one particular evening where, my wife is speaking with her and she's saying, you cannot do this. This Snapchat, watching Stranger Things, doing what your friends desire for you to do, you're going to be taken astray. You need to listen right now to what we're saying to you. God does not desire that you would turn away. And I remember the Lord telling me, go right up to her. I walked right up to her and I said, you need to delete your TikTok account as well. She said, I don't have TikTok. And I said, 
Okay, give me your phone, let me see. And the moment I said, give me your phone, let me see, she just pulled her phone back to her heart. And I, I didn't even desire to look at her phone. The Lord just told me, test her. She's probably lying. She just pulled her phone towards her and she said, it is on here. And that's when I realized, what else am I going to do right now? Force someone to serve God? Either somebody values God as great as he is, or they contend him because they have excess. I've got 18 pairs of shoes. Why would I need to just have one pair of shoes with God? It's probably because you don't know who God is. Because you think God is the giver of one shoe. <laughs> because your value is on shoes. <laughs> God's like, you need a shoes? You need a pair of shoes for this? I'll give you a pair of shoes for that. God's not looking to, to have your life be full of excess so that you could just be so wealthy that there's just so much happening and that you're like, oh, my life is just so full and I have too many things and I hardly ever wear that outfit. The Lord's saying like, you need something? I'll give it to you. You need some boots? There are some boots. You need some, some shoes to, to just walk around and be a normal person? There's some of those too. God knows what you need. God's not a cruel master. God's good. But if you are going to try to equate God with the excess of what the world presents as success, you are going to find yourself blind, deaf, and dumb. Because Jesus is saying here, he's saying, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. And I was explaining this to a college student. I remember explaining this to him and it was a very powerful thing. And I said to him, you see this, there's, let's, let's pretend there's, there, there's a long rope. And I was in the front of the green and I was looking at that back building from UNF all the way down. And I said, you see those doors right there? Let's say those doors are heaven and you're gonna meet Jesus inside of those doors. And I said, what Jesus says to you is he says, okay, so that we, you can meet me one day, I'm going to let you know about this much of the rope. There's a long rope going all the way down, all the way down till when you can meet me. But blessed is the man who's not offended of me here. Here's the first thing. And I said, will you do the first thing? And he said, I don't really know if I know how to do the first thing. And I said, that's actually the beautiful part. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. You don't have to know. I said, you know, does my daughter know that I'm trying to get her to walk when I'm, when I'm taking my hands and I'm just, and she's like holding on and she's like, I'm not certain what's happening here, but my dad is doing this. So maybe it's training me for something. Yes, I'm trying to teach you to walk. Right? When, when, when the child is a baby coming into be, becoming an, uh, uh, sorry, an infant, becoming a baby, becoming an, a child, there's things that you know, parents are doing. They're, they're seeing how, how strong is the child's neck. They, the child is supposed to roll on, his, on, the, on the belly. And when they roll on the belly, normally they're struggling to get the neck up. But naturally, they'll do it for a few moments and then ugh, they get tired. Their neck muscles are not established. And so the parents are watching for that. They want to discourage the child and have the child give up and start weeping and crying, right? At the same time, you don't want your child to not have neck muscles and then it grows up and it's five years old and, you know, just like can't really hold its neck up. So you have to, there's a, an understanding of the weight and the balance that's needed there. You understand what I'm saying? And so the Lord is the same. But Jesus is saying, take heed what you hear. So he's giving you a part of that rope and he's saying this much. Because if God were to say, this is what it means to be with me and he were to present that to you, you would feel so overwhelmed by who you were right now that you would not be able to be who, who he desires you to be. This is called grace. Teaching you each step. 
God extends his grace all the way out to the Gentiles and says, you don't know how to be like me. So I'm going to actually give you little by little by little by little by little. I'm going to reveal myself to you. The Bible says, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope till the end. For the grace that is to be revealed is to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's going to be brought unto you. There's going to be an overwhelming measure of God that's going to be brought unto you. More than you can ask or imagine. Pure joy. But right now when you're just holding the front of the rope, right now when you're holding the edge of the rope, what's pure joy is terrifying to you. Because you, you've been taught that joy is terror. You've been taught that Casting out the wicked man is so unloving and so unkind and all of these things. You, you've been taught that you should accept everyone. And so Jesus, all he can do is just put out a little bit of an edge of a rope and say, I love you. Can you get rid of porn? And you're saying, uh, I think so, Lord. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yes, I think I can. He's saying, okay, I've got a long way to go. But you listen to this, and this is what I said to this gentleman. I said to him, God measures out one meter to you, and we stood about a meter apart. And I said, and if you say yes, and you walk up to this meter, God is not going to just say, okay, another meter. God says, okay, two meters. And the Bible says, deep cries unto deep, Right? We see this in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel saying that he's standing in a river and he's, he's, he's down to his ankles. He, the water's touching his ankles. And it says that he goes even deeper still and it goes up to his knees and he goes even deeper still and it goes up to his waist and he goes even deeper still and it says that he, he cannot even stand. He's just having to float in the water. God is calling us deeper and deeper and deeper. But every time we go deeper, we have to realize that what the Bible says are parts of part of the elementary teachings of Christ. Baptistos, baptistos, baptisms. Not just one baptism, not one time where you went under the water and you thought you knew what it was to live for God. I think I know what it means to live for God. I'll do anything for Jesus. Come up and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Now you start getting immersed into the, tri the trial of your faith. But you see, what's, what's so scary about this is that if you don't take heed to this, listen to what Jesus says. He says, it sh if you with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. And unto you that hear shall more be what? Given. For he that has to him shall be given, and he that has not from him shall be taken away even that which he has. This is a very important understanding. I think this is one of the reasons why Peter says, for there must be heresies among you. There must be heresies among you so that them that are what? Approved, approved may do what? Be made manifest. It's as if to say there are a lot of people on the earth thinking that they're born again, sitting in this reprobate silver state where they're not learning, they're not learning, they're not learning, they're deaf, they're dumb. They're not being converted. They haven't come alive in Christ. They've just been sitting there and they've been burning and they've been burning and they've been burning and they've been burning. And so you have an outlook. You, you, you know, your outlook right now, like those of you who are in here, I know that you've been delivered from that place.
But you know, sometimes your outlook when you're when you're coming when you've come out of that heresy is like your outlook can be like, wow, like how much longer? How much longer am I gonna have to live with like everybody else in these heresies? Like, how much longer is it gonna be? How long has God been watching these people in the same oven, not change, not learn, be deaf, dumb, and blind? And so the question for you is not how much longer. I know Jesus is coming back. That's the glorious hope that we have. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for his glorious return, having hope, an everlasting hope that he will return, that he will take us up with him but you can almost lose your sense of purpose by just thinking, wow, like, so I'm just supposed to like preach to these people who are never going to learn anything. And it's interesting what Jesus says here. When he start, when he, before he says, take heed, listen to what he says in verse 23. He says, if any man have what? Ears, let him hear. It's interesting. Jesus is saying, if you have ears, hear this. Take heed what you hear. (laughs) It's like saying, if you have ears, listen to what I'm saying. Listen. It's like, wait, I thought you said listen to what I'm saying. Now you're saying listen again. How many listens are there? There's layers of listen. You could listen to me say this right now, and you could not be listening. And he's saying, take heed what you hear. And it's like I was speaking with that same gentleman this last week, Gigi and myself, and Josh speaking with him again. And I said to him, you know, and just without me even saying a word, Gigi brought that same, this same same scripture up, take heed what you hear. And he was like, this is the same thing. I was like, uh, it seems like the Lord is touching on this place with you. And I, I start reading Ephesians 5 to him and I'm showing him why he shouldn't go to the navs. I'm like, do you see this? Like, what does this say? Well, you know, and he starts saying some things about it. Well, I don't know, you know. I'm just going to give it a good chance. And I'm saying, well, the Bible's telling you not to do that. Do you see the Bible telling you not to do that? Do you see, like, remember the take heed? Like, I'm telling you right now that the Bible's telling you that that's a dangerous place to go. This is your two meter stretch. But you see how many people try to come close to God And they're like, yes, serving the Lord. And then it's like, ah, that, that, I've got to do that for God. And then it's like, I'll just leave it for some time. I'll just, I'll think about it. I've got to lose my family. I've got to. I've got to lose my old job. I've got to lose my, just just when you start talking about someone having loss in their life, I've got to lose my friends. I've got to lose Thanksgiving dinner. I've got to lose Christmas trees and and Christmas carols. And I've got to lose. uh, You know what starts to happen? The cares of this life begin to choke that word up. Or the persecution. I didn't think it was going to be this difficult. There's all types of things that begin to happen because the moment they hear it, they would desire to rejoice. I mean, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I'm saying, you know, you can't, you can't get baptized at one church. Orlando. Don't think you can just go get baptized in a whorehouse. And God's not going to leave you as reprobate silver over there in that heresy. 
Don't think you're going to go by the strange woman's house and she's not going to force you with an impudent face. She's not going to kiss you and cause you to stumble as her lips drip on you and tells you everything, everything's fine, everything's fine. You're saved. You're delivered. It will take you. The Bible says, agree with thine adversary when thou art in the way with him, lest he hand you over to the judge and the judge hands you over to the officer and the officer puts you in jail. He says, I tell you the truth. Verily I say unto you, you shall not come out from dance until you have paid the utmost farthing. Samson, you're not coming out of pushing that millstone round and round and round with those blind eyes. until it's the end of you. <clears throat> Samson serves as, as, serves as an example because he's such a mighty man. He's so strong, he's so capable, it says how the mighty have fallen. It's an understanding that you have to understand the thing that's going to save you is not how mighty you are or how much you think you can save yourself from it. You cannot be saved without Jesus Christ saying, you, hear, you heard what I said and that's why I'm going to save you. You listened to me when it was very hard and that's why you're going to be saved. Remember that hard situation you had to go through? I've had to go through those things too. That's what Jesus is saying. It says that he is a man of many sorrows. He knows what it feels like to be rejected. He knows what it feels like to be cast out. He knows what it feels like to be scorned upon. He knows what it feels like to be persecuted. He knows what it feels like to be disbanded. He knows what it feels like to be feel alone. He knows what it feels like. It's kind of like a maze. You're going through a maze. Do I go left or do I go right? And the Lord's saying, Go right, and it says, dead end. You're like, Lord, you're saying go right. It says dead end. The Lord's like, yeah, you're going to die. It's called a baptism. You're going to die. You're going to have to go through an eye of the needle. It's going to be a hole this big, just this big, and you're going to have to go through it. Are you ready? I don't know how that's possible. I'll help you. Ah, maybe I'll try this other one, Lord. This is a this says this has a green pasture right here. The Lord's like, I told you to go through the dead end. I'm gonna have to die to go through the dead end. The Lord's like, I know the way out of the maze. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. I see the maze. I see your journey. I know your frame. I know you can do it. Lord, it's, it's impossible. Yes, it's impossible. So go over there. But Lord, there's a green pasture. And this is where people say, I'll try the green pasture first. And this is, this is what would be inside of a horror movie. Okay, go to the green pasture, go to the green pasture. All of a sudden, you find out there's this nice little goat over there and he's just so kind and he's just so nice until he starts eating every single thing that you have and starts actually biting your, your heels and you start bleeding and you're, now you're running and he's, his eyes turn red and then he's going after you. You're like, ah, and then you're trying to go back to the dead end, but all of a sudden there's a wall there and you're like, Lord, where, where am I going? And the Lord says, you should have take heed, took, took heed with what you heard.
you're saying, well, well, I, I mean, uh, at least I can go back to this church. The Lord's saying, go over there. Men will burn you and burn you and burn you and burn you and burn you till there's nothing left because you have nothing left because you're blind, because you don't trust God, because you don't trust me to take you through the impossible. You see, when you, when you come and follow Jesus, you've got to understand what Jesus is asking you to do. He's asking you to do something impossible. It is not easy. Scarcely are the righteous saved. You have to go against every odd and God is on that <laughs> somewhat chance. The Lord's like, okay, Next part of the maze, you're like, okay, whew, I made it through the hole that was this, that was this big. Whew, thank the Lord. Now the rest of the journey, I can just walk forward. And it's like, all of a sudden you see a, a, a rope the size of a hair and you're like, I'm supposed to walk on that? And Lord's like, yes, I'm gonna lead you. You need to stay close to me right now. Lord, why can't I just use those stones over there? because those stones are gonna burn you. I'm telling you to take the hairline. Lord, this is impossible. Yes, it's impossible. Are you my friend? Yes, Lord, I'm your friend. Then get on the rope. Okay. I'm not going to stand here as a witness to you today and tell you that God's just going to make it very, very easy for you. Maybe your first few weeks of salvation. I don't know if that's still happening in the earth, but when I was first born again, it was like everything was easy. I remember I was just walking places and I would just, I remember just, I'd lay my hands on people. I remember being home back in South Africa for the first few weeks and <coughs> so many miracles happening. I remember this man just walking inside of the church and I just stood up and I just looked at him and he said, is the pastor here? And I said, you don't need a pastor. And I just gave him a prophetic word and he just went on his knees. And I was like, I called my, 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 my father who was living, my father in the flesh who was living here in America. And I was like, you've got to see what's happening here. God is like showing up in every place. Like things are just happening. And I remember this man, he's, he's, he's on his knees and he's crying out, Lord, please help me. Lord, please help me. My wife just kicked me out. And I said to him, your wife kicked you out because of what you've been doing. The, the Lord says he desires to deliver you from that. I remember five days later, he's walking down the street and he says, hey, I'll let you know my wife let me back in the house. I don't drink anymore. I said, thank the Lord. He said, yes, I'm serving God. I was like, wow, this is Wow, there's just miracles happening everywhere. And then all of a sudden, like, like that, it was like, I can't feel anything. And I remember thinking, I'm done. God's done with me. I must have done something wrong. And I was in fear and trembling. And I'm like, Lord, please, I'm putting this worship song on so I can feel the presence of God again. And that's not working. I'm like, maybe it's because the song is old. Maybe it's me. Something's wrong. And I'm just walking around. I'm like, and the Lord's like, I'm going to teach you what it's like to walk by my word, not by your feelings, son. And God has been very gracious. And God is very gracious. And he's very kind. And the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And you know what happens? You're coming up against that wall and you're hitting that wall and you're like, why isn't the wall there anymore? And the Lord's like, because you didn't take me heed with what you heard. Go the next time. And so the Bible says, if any man, any man, any man, say any man, lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives what? Freely and upbraideth not. So this person gets on their knees and they say, God, please rescue me from this goat. And the Lord says, yes, I will rescue you. All of a sudden, a person opens their eyes and they see a straight walkway. Walkway. There used to be a wall here. Okay, I'm going to walk. And they come up to another cross section. And what do you think's there? Well, it's a beautiful meadow again. But on this side, is three lions. And the Lord says, 
go this way where the three lions are going. Now, I'm not saying that you go where lions go, but I'm just giving you an example, please. The Bible says that beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. You have to understand the Bible says that they will be like ravening wolves, right? It likens evil men. But what if I, I've had, have had it in, in my life where I've discipled some people and the Lord, the Lord has actually led them through a place where they had, to, they had to go past some lions, like Daniel had to go into the lion's den for a time. You know what Daniel could have said? Daniel could have said, well, they're saying that you can't serve any God except for the, you know, the king, so I'll just pray when no one's watching. I'll, I'll cut down my three times of prayer a day to two times of prayer a day. I've got to make it. You know, I don't, want to, I, I don't desire to not make it. I'm going to be wise. Daniel didn't do that. He opened the windows. Prayed to the Lord. Lord. And they're like, we got him. That's how we can get him. We can get him with his God. Daniel's like, yes, you got me. I pray to the Lord, my God. <laughs> You're going in the lion's den. You're going in the lion's den, Daniel. There's no, there's no hope for you. No hope. They're hungry. They're really, really hungry. These lions are really hungry. Go in there. He goes in there. <laughs> you see, because if you know your God, the Bible says, they that know their God shall do great exploits shall do great things. Why? Because the reason the challenges come up, the reason why you weren't supposed to make it through that hole, you weren't supposed to make it with those dens of li- that den of lions. You weren't supposed to make it. There were many times you shouldn't have made it. Many are the afflictions of the what? Righteous, but God delivers him from them all. <coughs> and so there's many people standing in a position and what is their position? Oh, God, I just, I love you so much. I just want to serve you with all my heart. And the Lord says, do you really? And eventually, after time and time and time again of God constantly putting that, you're saying, Lord, make me wise, make me wise, make me wise. God constantly puts that test right there. It's like reprobate silver. Every time he puts you through a fiery trial, you learn nothing, 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 nothing. You stayed at step three your whole life. Because you didn't take heed with what you heard. When the Lord said to you, go that way, it's impossible. You said, uh, you know, I'm not really taught to value that. And when the Lord said, get away from those people. Well, Lord, let's not be too harsh on them. I know the Bible says it's not good to accept the persons of the wicked, but they are my family. Okay, You introduce your own version of Bible. You get to live by your own version of Bible. God will put you in a delusion where you actually think you're still with God, but, you, but you're not. Where you are actually in a heresy and you actually accept the teachings of that heresy because it doesn't challenge you to get out of that place and you stay at step three for the rest of your life. And then you'd like to tell God, I knew you. Wasn't I at step three with you, Lord? The Lord's like, There's a hundred steps before you make it into my arms. And you got stuck at step three because you were offended because of me. That's why why this message is blind, deaf, dumb. Your choice. Is it your choice? Because what is... What is worse? What is worse? If God just, God just locks up the maze from you ever getting out? That there's no hope? You can never get out of the maze? Do you think God is powerful enough to lock you up so you can never escape? Yes. It's not very difficult for God to just say, okay, never get out. Just walk away. Reprobate silver shall men call them. You'll never get out. You're going to burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn. You're going to burn your whole life. You're going to burn all your time away. Because when God put the option in front of you and he said, do what I'm saying. 
And you'd say, wow, that's cruel of God. Listen, would you like to get out of the maze or not? Why am I in the maze in the first place? You're in the maze because the Gentiles locked you in there. You're a foreigner. You're an alien to God. And now you're coming to know the ways of God. And every time you read the Bible, God's showing you more of his ways. He showed his ways to Moses and his acts and to the children of Israel. He's saying, this is who I am. This is what I value. This is what I think. This is what makes me glad. This is what makes me sad. And if you know these six things, does the Lord hate? Seven are an abomination unto him. If you know these things, you know what God hates. You know what God loves. You know what God delights in. You know what God enjoys. You know what God loves. You know what he cherishes. You know what he, he holds close and dear to his heart. That you begin to delight in those things. And the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. When you delight yourself in God, what happens to you? Well, you start changing. You used to like a, a whole closet full of shoes, but now you'd like a whole house full of orphans. Useful things that you could make powerful testimonies and see people come out of darkness or and all those vain things just fade away and you finally find a purpose in life. And God says, you desired this your whole life, but you didn't know what you were born with. Someone twisted you and corrupted your DNA. When you came out, they twisted you from day one. You came out of that hospital with a, with a giant bow on your head because that's what they thought was valuable. The bow was bigger than your face. Because that's what they thought was valuable. I can't let foreigners into my kingdom. So I've created a way. I've created a maze. And if you follow what I say, you're going to make it out. This, this maze has afflictions. But if you trust me, I'm your God. I will deliver you from every single one. I know the passcode to every single door in this maze. I know how to shut off valve for every single lava trap on this maze. He knows everything. And he can deliver you from everything. All you have to do is listen and obey. All you have to do is listen and obey. You know, at some point, it just starts becoming easier. You're saying, Ty, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> When you love God, when you truly learn to love God, you start actually, you can actually be spiritually minded. That when somebody says like, oh, you're going to lose another family member, you're like, yeah, like, Lord, just, I just want to be with you, like, so close. Like, if there's anything in the way, it's like, this is your family you're talking about. It's like, no, it's not. Who is my mother, my brother, my sister? Yes! Yes! You're not in a hopeless place. They're going to die and go to hell anyway. It's your mind that doesn't do the math right. You're not thinking, oh, when we get before Jesus, they're not going to make it. So I have basically a 60-year relationship on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the sand right now. Okay, I guess I'm going to build my house here. I'm not building with you. You're not going with me. Go with me or, or I'm not going with you. Now you start actually becoming like the Lord. Now you start actually saying, listen, like, you're going to hear what I'm saying? You're not? Okay. Bye -bye. Oh, you're just going to walk away like that? Like nothing ever matters? Yeah, nothing sand matters to me. Just the rock. You understand? That's my life. I love Jesus. I'm getting married. 
I've got a husband. I'm getting married. I can't play these games with you. Oh, that's so heartless. Heartless to who? Because to God, it's like you're saying, Lord, how, how big? Lord's like, it's this big. You're like, that's, that's probably enough room for me. <laughs> Let's go. I'm probably gonna have to lose a lot of things, Lord. Which is the first thing that you suggest? Lord's like, the backpack's gotta go. You're like, no backpack, Lord. I don't really know how I'm gonna eat, but I'm gonna get through this hole and then we'll eat. <laughs> Lord's like, no, I put some food right there in the corner for you. You're like, ah, oh, you're so good, Lord. He's like, you trusted me, so I knew you were going to need something to eat. I, I'm good. You go through. You're like, wow. Well, ah, a new backpack. Thank you, Lord. Wow, this is much sturdier than the last one. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. That's exactly how it is. You could have had your old torn up backpack back there, or you could have got a brand new backpack if you would have just would have followed through what God said. Not that it's about the backpack. And those who are perfectly minded would understand that because that backpack's going to get lost a lot of times. Or as many times as the Lord wills. Maybe the Lord wants to the backpack with you the whole time. It's his choice. It's his choice. I thought you said it was your choice. Well, is it? It's his choice in what he gives you. Is he a good giver of gifts? Is he a good God? Is God good? Is God loving? Is God kind? Is he compassionate? Is he full of mercy? Does the Bible say the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it? Does the Bible say that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and that without burdensome toil? Does the Bible say that his favor lasts? A lifetime? Are the promises of God not good? Yes, they're good, but it's if you will hear my voice, if you will hearken and obey, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then, 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 if and then, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Then I'll do the work. Then I'll be that God to them. Then I'll have kindness. Then I'll have goodness. Then all of the things that the Bible says about God that are good, that are in those devotional books, they actually apply to you, but the people reading the devotional books think they apply to them. But they sit inside of their reprobate silver tank while they're burning and burning and burning, opening up our daily bread to say, ah, that's going to be my life one day. You should have listened. You should have listened. Now you got to read books about what it's going to be like. And you're going to sit there wondering about what heaven's going to be like rather than actually doing what the Bible says. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will can happen here. And I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel from earth. I'm saying that the Bible says very clearly, only with my eyes will I see the reward of the wicked. am I going to throw those things out? Well, you know, it's just the time. That was David saying that. And you know, uh, the reason we have prophecies is so that we can see like, you know, what they were going through. It's like, what a boring salvation you have. What a boring life you must have trying to, trying to make it like, like Isaiah. Isaiah wasn't ministering to us when he, when he wrote his book. Well, that was happening in Isaiah's time. Okay. Stay in your little furnace and keep burning. Okay. Prophets are constantly saying, in that day, in that day, in that day, in that day. Why are they saying that? It's like, they were talking about like four or five months down the road. Really? 
Is that why half of those things didn't happen? Is that why they prophesied 500 years in a, ahead for Jesus' birth in that day? Yes, because they were the prophets tied. They had to do that. Oh, is that why Peter said the prophets ministered to us? And all these things happened unto them for in samples and they were written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. I receive the whole Bible. I receive it. <laughs> it's good. It's good to just say, this is so powerful. Like, for Robert Breaker to say that the book of Hebrews or the book of James wasn't written for us, it's like basically saying like, poor orphan, poor bastard, really. What a poor bastard, couldn't even get what Israel got. God just left him like, okay, here we go. Here's some rags, Gentiles. See what you can do. If God was good, Paul said that we are of the commonwealth. And we are co-heirs. The Lord desires us to inherit. The Lord desires us to have. And not just to have for ourselves, but to have so that we might give, realizing that it is better to give than to receive. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that, the, that God in his, in his kindness and his mercy said that he, although he could have all the glory for himself and be glorified by himself in and of himself, he said, I desire to welcome you into glory. That there's going to be a few select people that are willing to be my friends. That I'm going to welcome and say, enter the joy of the Lord. Enter a place where joy doesn't cease, where there's no more tears. And people want to, people try to just, you know, write it up as if it's like a contract. You know, if you just say this prayer, then, you know, you can get forgiven of your sin and you can go to heaven. I don't really know about you, but it's like, it's like saying, you know, one day, if you sign this contract here, one day you can go live on a farm. And you're like, I don't know anything about farming. What do I do? And they're like, don't worry about it. Just keep living like, a, like, you're, like you're in the city. But one day you're just going to get taken to the farm. You're like, can you at least teach me something about a farm? I, I try to at least get ready a little bit so that when I get there, I can actually know how to actually do some work or something. You know, like, what do I do? Do do I grab a shovel or something? Like, how do you actually do that? I've never done this type of work before. It's like, don't worry about it. You'll see when you get there. And then you read the book of Revelation. And it's like, and you're going to own your own farm one day. And you're like, uh, 10 cities? I'm going to own my own farm one day? What am I going to do? How am I going to judge 10 cities? Is that why I have Moses' books? <laughs> Is that why I have a full Bible? That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God? Oh, that's not just for Jesus. That's for everyone. You see, you see the lie? The lie is that one day you're going to change so great that you're going to all of a sudden go to heaven and then you're just going to know things. But you see, when you increase in the knowledge of God, the Bible says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That when you have the knowledge of God, that that knowledge of the Lord, knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The Bible says in all thy getting, get what? Understanding. Why? Because if you have understanding, the Bible says that by understanding, a house is furnished and filled with all pleasant, pleasant, uh, precious and pleasant riches. It's filled. It's actually sustained by wisdom, by mercy. The throne is upheld. A king by judgment establishes the land, but he that receives gifts overthrows it. If you don't know what overthrows a, a whole land, then you will probably give it away. I don't want to judge. 
You need to judge, otherwise you'll overthrow the whole land. Do you see, the Lord desires for you to know these things so that when he comes, he can say, you are trustworthy. You are trustworthy. You are trustworthy of what I'm about to give you. You were faithful with the little and I gave you the much. In a land where judgment was contemned, you upheld judgment. (laughs) That's a beautiful thing. (coughs) Think about this for a moment. Listen to the rest of this verse here. Verse 26, and he said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man cast a seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth the forth fruit of herself, say herself, and the blade, then the ear. (laughs) It's interesting how he's talking about physical ears before he starts talking about corn ears. (laughs) Then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts the sickle, puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. It's interesting. Jesus is saying, he's using this word, so. So is the kingdom of God. First, he's talking about your ears. Then he says, so is the kingdom of God. And he's using corn ears. As an example, that's so beautiful. They even call it the ear of the corn. It's like (laughs) faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And once that faith brings forth fruit, that's when he says, I've got you. That's when he reaps you. But until then, it's, it's all just hearing brings an understanding with what the work that we have that we're doing currently right now we're just going forward it's like hear this 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 do does anybody hear this do you hear this do you hear this anybody hear this hear this and it's like we don't really know what's happening we're seeing some signs of something but we don't know exactly but we'll know when the harvest is there we'll know when but some people will never know. Let's go to Isaiah chapter six so that you can understand a little bit more about the state of the people that are deaf, dumb, and blind, and why it is that they cannot hear why it is they cannot see and why it is they cannot speak. Even though they speak words, they speak vain words. Even though they hear, they never understand. And even though they see, they never perceive. It is a waste. It is a vanity. It is a vanity. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. It's interesting, the Lord just immediately gives him what he should say. He said, here am I, send me. And he says, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. See that excess? That's what fat is. It's, it is excess. It's what you're not using. Make the heart of this people fat. It's Matthew chapter 13. 
where Jesus says, Therefore speak I unto them in parables, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, for this people's heart is waxed gross. And that word gross is the same word for fat. In their, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have heard them and have not heard them. But if we continue in Isaiah chapter six, it says, and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and lest they hear with their ears and understand and their heart with their heart and convert and be healed. So there's people right now, Jesus is the word of God. He's the word of God. There's people right now reading the Bible every day. They're looking every day, but they don't perceive it. They're hearing every day, but they don't understand it. Every day, something is coming towards their heart, but they cannot understand it. They cannot know it and they cannot open their heart to it. I remember this young lady. I, we used to take my daughter to a, to a playground for a time. And we didn't know the statutes and judgments. We didn't know what we, were, what we were getting ourselves into. But we were going to this playground and it was owned by a lady who, you know, we just thought, oh, it's an indoor playground. It's a place for our child to at least be inside. You know, we live in Florida we think it would be a nice thing to just have her there. Maybe she can meet some friends. We didn't really think anything about how strange that situation could be. So we did that while we were in the midst of apostasy. And we met this young lady who started to get to know us. And as we actually started coming out of apostasy, she started to know our story a little bit more. And we started telling her, it's very serious. Like you need to come away from these things. And we eventually left. And she didn't see us again. But I remember the specific day when she called my wife. She called my wife and she was frantic on the phone. I use that word. Uh, She was very, very shaken. Overly so. (sighs) Something happened. Something happened last night and I had this dream and I believe it was God. And I knew you would understand. I I know that other people don't understand this. Only you would understand this. I don't think anyone else would understand me right now. So I'm calling you because other people are going to think I'm crazy. And Danielle's saying, what happened? And she says, last night, my husband and I, he and my husband said to me, hey, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, smoke some weed together. And I said, I don't really know. I don't like doing that. That's not something I like to do. I don't really feel like I need to. You're going to just relax. You're going to be fine. We're just going to relax together. It's a very relaxing thing. Just try it. You're going to try it. She's like, okay, I'll try it. She's convinced by her husband to try it. And she just, she t- just takes some, some marijuana and she just goes down to sleep. She gets very, very sleepy. She goes down to sleep and all of a sudden she has a dream that she's going to hell. I don't know exactly what happened. I could be wrong. Danielle, if you are able to correct me in, in, what, in what actually happened. But she has some dream that shakes her to, I believe, the bottom of where she is. And she's calling my wife and she's saying, please, you have to, something's going to happen. I already know, I already heard God and God said, I, this is my last chance. And I, I don't know if she was saying all those types of things, but I don't know if she said my last chance, but she's saying like, this is urgent. I have to do something. I have to warn all the people around me. I have to say these things. And Danielle's saying like, you're, you're waking up. You're waking up to these things. The Lord is waking you up to this right now and you're realizing your state. And you're realizing what needs to take place and you need to actually get yourself into a place. And Danielle tells her, I believe Danielle gave her an ordinance of of saying, I believe you should read the book of Jeremiah. Or she had said that she felt led to read the book of Jeremiah. And so for the next two days, she's just texting my wife and saying, 
Oh, I just saw this in the book of Jeremiah and God's really, he's, he's, his anger's coming, his wrath is coming and I already know that's gonna happen and I'm, I'm gonna tell my husband and, and we're gonna stop doing this and we're gonna stop doing that and we're gonna stop doing this and stop doing that and, we're, and, we're, and I'm gonna tell him and I'm gonna tell his parents as well and, and they've gotta stop doing this and, and we start hearing instantly, there's judgments that need to be executed, there's judgments that need to be executed and the Lord is sharing a lot with this young lady. And I remember saying to my wife, I said, wow, like, is this even happening right now? This is powerful. God is just, I remember her. She's very, she was very worldly. Like she just woke up and she's like, she's already saying like, she's sending scripture. She's like, I'm sharing this with my husband this evening. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this. And I believe I could be wrong, but it wasn't a week later. And Danielle gives a call or she gives a call to Danielle and Danielle says, you know, I I desire to warn you. I desire to warn you right now. Please like understand, like the Bible says, all tables are full of vomit. No place is clean. Don't go into the church that you were going into. You've told me about that church. Don't go to that church. And she says, She just starts saying some things and she starts saying, listen, you know, all my life I've always trusted my husband. He's always like, he's always been like more into the Bible than me. So I do trust him. And, and I'm saying to Danielle, trust not a friend, neither put confidence in God, keep the doors of your mouth from from her that lies in your bosom. She's got to realize she's woken up. She's more awake than him. She's got to realize that. And Danielle saying to her on the call, listen, um, I know this is difficult for you to understand right now, but you you have woken up and can I ask you some questions? Like, why was your husband smoking marijuana? Let's just ask some clear questions right now. Why was this happening? Well, he was just saying to do that to relax, but I know his heart. I know his heart. His heart's not like that. It starts like that. And it's like, but I thought you said that you weren't going to go. Well, you know what happened is this Sunday, he, this Sunday he went to the church and I know God was there because he was literally sending me notes that were on the PowerPoint presentation. He was literally saying, this woman is saying right now, he was just sending the notes to her somehow saying like, this woman is saying it's time for a drastic change or it's time for something. I forget the exact ordinance. Maybe, Danielle, I don't know if you remember the exact thing. Something like that. I don't, I don't desire to say exactly what it was. But it was like, apparently there was a woman preaching. And she was saying, someone in here is needing to, a drastic change in their life. And they're like, we knew it was God. We knew it was for us. And, and, and Danielle and I were like, I don't, I don't know if she's, I don't know if she's taking heed. It sounds like she's slipping back into the carnal mind slowly. The week after that, I believe, Danielle called her, trying to warn her again of that this church was going to lead her astray. And her words to Danielle were, you know, after all that's happened in the last two weeks, I finally realized the reason why all of that happened. It was because my husband was not supposed to go. He, you know, to, was he, that he was supposed to go somewhere in the military. Yes, she heard the Lord clearly say these words on the night that she woke up. It's not a brick and mortar building. She heard the Lord say that that very sentence. It's not a brick and mortar building. And Danielle's trying to explain to her, that's about the church. It's not a brick and mortar building. It's actually supposed to be people who serve God, not who act like they serve God. She's trying to explain this, but it's all happening so very quickly. When she started to shrink back. Well, I feel like God is calling us to somewhere that's not a brick and mortar building, somewhere like Afghanistan. And my husband, he's in the military. And maybe the whole reason why this was happening is because we're supposed to actually travel as a family together to Afghanistan. But you were warning people about hell just two weeks ago. 
and now we've made it Afghanistan, right? This is, and she's still not in Afghanistan right now. So what was all that for, right? What was all of that for? What was that? What was that? That was someone waking up from their slumber for just a moment before God just gave them to another fire. Did she have a chance? She did have a chance. Just like I had a chance. When I heard the Lord say to me in that, in that condominium that I was staying in, in that, in that particular, some of you would call it a flat. I'm staying in there and the Lord says to me, if you touch one drumstick on one cymbal or one drumhead, you are directly against me. There's absolutely no way I could have disobeyed that and made it out. I truly believe that. I called that pastor and I said, I need to meet with you urgently. What's the earliest you can meet with me? He said, tomorrow morning. I said, tomorrow morning. I was the creative pastor. It, it, the whole thing had, had to happen because I had to hold the whole thing together. Yes, there were delegations. Yes, there were people who were selecting songs. Yes, there were musicians who already knew those songs. I'm not saying that I was the only person doing the work. I'm saying the orchestration of all of those pieces together was, was falling upon me. And I knew the Lord was telling me because I used to play the instrument that wasn't there. If the bassist didn't arrive, I'd play the bass. If the drummer didn't arrive, I'd play the drums. If the keyboardist wasn't there, I'd play the keyboard. I'd play whatever instrument was not there. And I just remember understanding from the Lord that if I touch one of those instruments, that if I just touched those sticks, that I was going to die. I heard that. And my, the fear of God that was inside of me was to depart. I was fully aware what it meant. I was fully aware that it meant that many who called themselves my friend were no longer my friends. But God is looking for friends. God is looking for friends. People who are willing to call God their friend and say, that's my friend. You're not going to touch my friend. Oh, you said my friend's name in vain? Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, then you'll just lose your job, okay? I don't think you understand how this works. My, my dad owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You can't do anything to me. You can't do anything to me. Do you know this God? It's Ezekiel chapter 15. That says very clearly. Let's go there. Ezekiel chapter 15. Sorry, there's one more thing I'd like to say about Isaiah chapter 6 for those of you who are still there. You'd like to ask yourself the question, how long, how long do you stay inside of that furnace? How long do you stay inside of that, that area where God will just burn and burn and burn? This is what he says. He says, how long? I, then I said, Lord, how long? He answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses be without man and the houses without man. 
and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return. (laughs) And shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Let's go to Ezekiel 15. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of, the, son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? Or the branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Is it good for anything else? Is what he's asking. You've read this before on a Sunday. Is it good for anything else? Is a vine good for anything else? Are you going to make a table out of a vine? I don't think so. It's good for grapes. (laughs) You might be able to put a vine like dressed around a table, but it's going to go bad eventually. It's not really good for anything. Maybe vain decorations or something. Or will men take a pin to hang hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. It is it is meat for any. uh, Is it meat for any work? Behold. When it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat for work, for, uh, meat yet for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, a vine as the vine tree among the trees in the fo- uh, of the forest, which, have given, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will set my face against them that they shall go out from one fire and another fire shall do what? Devour them. So they're going to go out from one fire. It's almost like Danielle caught this young lady. I said to Danielle, I really do believe this is what happened. This young lady was coming out of a fire. And just before she was going back in, she was completely in a good place. And that's why, what do you see online? What do you see people saying online? Well, I'm really woke right now, right? They got woke. Everybody's talking about how they got woke. It's interesting. They may have really actually gotten woke. It's as if to say John Gabbana, Kanye West, Justin Bieber might really have actually woken up to the truth of what God's word is only to be put back to slumber again. Oh, you're awake? Go back to sleep. Is God saying that? Well, is he? Is God cruel that he just puts people to sleep all the time? It says they shall sleep a perpetual sleep. Is God cruel that he just, call, he just desires to put everyone to sleep? What if sleep is kind of like mercy? Because he could just put you to death. Because herein lies the reality. Are you going to meet with the measure that was given to you? Are you going to say, this is what the Lord said and this is what I'm going to do? God has said this and I will not contemn this 10%. If God gave me one meter, I'm going one meter. 
If you go half a meter, the Lord's going to give you only half a meter more. Jesus is saying that all of these things, it says, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And Jesus is saying, That from the treasure of your heart, you bring forth good things. From the good treasure of your heart, you'd bring forth good things. You have an opportunity. You've been given an opportunity now to, to hearken, to listen, to hear God's word and to do what he's saying. And when you do that, you have more opportunity to live. He says, I'll put before you the choice of life and death. Choose life that you and your children may live. He doesn't say, I have made the choice, not you, but you. He said, you choose. But it's interesting how the choice works. Because you can't choose what you choose. Listen to what I just said. It's very important that you understand this. You cannot choose what you choose. You can't say, okay, today's the day where I'm going to choose which of my family members are going to rise up against the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't stand up one day and just say, today I'm going to choose whether I'm going to be able to do this or whether I'm not going to be able to do this. Today I'm going to choose whether I'm actually going to be continuing with this friend or whether I'm not. You cannot choose what you're going to choose. You're just going to be presented with a choice. That's part of walking through this maze is you're walking through and you're presented with a choice. Left or right. The pathway has not presented itself another way. It hasn't presented itself with five options. It's presented you with an option, life or death. And you know, when Abraham was going with Lot, it was exactly like that. Abraham said, Lot, you choose which way you would like to go. I know the Lord is with me either way. And Lot sees this green pasture. He sees this green land and he says, we're going to go here. And he goes. And where does he, where does he end up? Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says that the way, the other way, was not an easy way. And Abraham's like, all right, everyone. <laughs> We're going to go this way. And God, the Bible says that God increased him and blessed him abundantly. <laughs> when you have faith, you choose to trust God. And when the Lord tells you, this one's going to be a difficult choice, you know it's not actually difficult. That's why David says, I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If, if you're going to be there, it's going to be a good time. If you're going to be there, it's going to be good. If you desire a friend like God, and he is to desire you as his friend and rejoice over you, he's going to ask you if you trust him, if you fear him, if you know him, all the other friends of God have been tested. All the other witnesses stand around and say, you can trust him. I made it. <laughs> you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're standing there saying, it works. Just trust God. It works. I don't, doesn't make sense. Don't, don't think about it. <laughs> Down there, don't think about it. God doesn't, doesn't work the way you think. You're, you're capable of things you have no idea about. <laughs> it's, 
it seems pressing and difficult and like you're never going to make it, but that's actually the Lord is going to help you right now. This is like the time where he actually shows up. It seems like nothing's left. It seems like you're going to sacrifice your own son. I know, but just keep going. God's there. It seems like nothing's left. It seems like you've run out of everything, but it's okay. He's right there. Do you desire to know God? Do you desire to know God? Do you desire to know God? Titus chapter 1. This is when Paul's talking about it. He says, for there are many, this is verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subverse, subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. It says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You know, I said this last night as, as I went live very early, I believe, in the morning. <laughs> the Lord was really, really unctioning this understanding. He had given a dream yesterday about the glory of God and why, why man fell short of the glory of God and just giving those scriptures and giving a good understanding, knowing that this was the very thing that was being challenged. And I talked a little bit about Josiah and Hudson and Salvation Church and Pastor Ryan and Matt. It says, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. He's talking about these people. Vain talkers, deceivers. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men and turn that turn from the truth. Now listen to what he says here. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled... And unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, right? This is, the, this is that same fire. They profess that they know God. They go to church on Sunday. They do all these things. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, what? Reprobate. Just cycling, never coming to the understanding of why they're doing that good work, never coming to the understanding, never being able to learn their lesson, never being able to come back and apologize, never being able to actually say what's right, never being able to actually learn the lesson that they should have learned out of that situation. The question is, is God a preferer of persons or did somebody not listen? Jesus says, he opens up by saying, let him who has ears, let him hear. And at the very same time, he's saying, take meat or take heed with what you hear. Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be, meet, uh, shall be met unto you. I pray that you understand that Jesus said many righteous men and prophets sought to hear the things that you're hearing. And I'll say the same thing to you. If you're in this room or if you're listening online and you are actually hearing what I'm saying, because there's many who listen to what I'm saying, but they don't have ears. 
like Rusty Shackelford. He doesn't have ears. He's a cartoon character. He doesn't, he doesn't listen. There's many who don't have ears. Even though they have ears, they don't have ears. But if you are listening to what I'm saying, if you hear what I'm saying and you understand that God is calling you to hearken unto him and God is telling you that if you don't listen, that he will cause you to actually walk in this path. It says, therefore, because they did not love the truth, therefore God gave them over to a powerful delusion. That they might believe a lie. God doesn't desire for you to be in a powerful delusion. God doesn't desire for you to be lost. God, that's not his desire. But what happens when somebody turns away? What happens when somebody just decides that the maze is theirs and that that's, that's theirs and they're just going to live in the maze and that's what they're going to do? What do you do? When the whole maze was designed so that someone could get to know you, but they don't even do that, what do you do? What do you do? You have to think of this from God's side. And maybe there's some things today that you yourself need to repent of to say, Lord, I haven't been hearkening as as much as I should be. I haven't been, I haven't been giving, taking heed to everything that I've heard. I've heard some things and I've just cast them aside. I've heard some things and I've just, I haven't put priority on those things that I've heard. I need to be more vigilant. I need to be, I need to be more, I need to be listening more. Maybe there's one area in your life where you know the Lord has already said something to you, but you are not hearkening in that area. Maybe there's an area where the Lord is actually desiring for you to actually come forward and be be the way that you should be about listening about something that he's told you, but you you are not doing that because you actually have sorrow in your heart or you have something else that's trying to hold you back and you're saying, Lord, I don't desire to give that up or I don't desire to have that thing be or I don't desire to, to do that thing have to realize like what is what is life what is life think about this for a moment what is life (laughs) you can either just look at your life and see all the things that you're losing or you can look at your life and see all the things you have to gain You can see that rope and say, Lord, what is it? The Lord says, it's this. You're like, okay, what else, Lord? The Lord's saying, well, actually, you've got to wait here and you've got to learn this. Okay, Lord, I'll learn this. And then he he meets out another measure towards you and you say, yes, Lord. And you can begin to just take it and say, Lord, as you've given it to me, I will. But there's so many people who are slow to learn. Jesus said this to his disciples. He called them He said, fools, oh fools, and slow to learn. There can be a a slowness in your learning. Or there can be a quickness in your learning. And I will tell you the truth. That you would be delivered of many afflictions if if you just listen in the first place. You don't have to learn the lessons that Jonah, that Jonah learned. You could read the book of Jonah and say, not doing that, and it's over. Or you can go into the belly of the, the whale or the, the fish and, and, and find yourself in a place where you're like, okay, this is, not, this is not where I desire to be. I will obey you, Lord. My question to you is, whose choice was that? Was that God's choice? God said, go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish. Whose choice was that? Am I saying that if you're called of God, that God doesn't put you into a situation like he put Jonah in? No, he does. The question is, three days is a fullness of time in a whale or a fish. Three days is a fullness of time. You might think it would be three days for yourself, but it might not be. 
It might be 40 days. It might be two years. It might be three months. God knows the timing. But the question is, what's going to happen inside of that fish? Are you going to get on your knees? Are you going to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Give me another chance. Give me five inches of rope. Because if he gives you five inches of rope, that means he's going to pull you out. The question is, what will you do when you come out? Are you going to go there with joy? Are you going to keep having the heart of Jonah to come back and say, I I told you, Lord, you're going to do this. This is the reason why I didn't desire to do this. I don't desire to judge Jonah unnecessarily. But I will say that God can do anything. It says, God works all those things for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So it means that even for you, even for myself, it's actually for our good. Oh, this took a turn that I wasn't expecting. You should be thinking, it's going to be better than I was expecting. But when your mind thinks, sometimes your mind thinks, I know if I go to Nineveh, they're all just going to repent and then God's going to be merciful. And I know God, he's just going to let them keep doing this. And God's saying, are you my friend or you just, you just figured me out? Do you know the depths of God? Would you like to know the depths of God? It's not depressing. It's joyful. It's beautiful. It's not a bad end. It's a good end. I'd go as far as saying, the reason why it's not the way you thought it would be is because it's actually going to end well. The reason why it's taking a turn that you didn't expect it is because it's actually going to end well. (laughs) You have to trust God. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Why have you accused the Lord of something else? Why have you told the Lord that the maze should have been written differently? Do you know the Lord? Do you know his ways? Are you okay with being completely upside down by the time you're done? Only to find out you're actually the right way up? (laughs) Are you okay with this looking nothing like you thought it would, only so that you could have new thoughts? You've got to let go. You've got to let go of trying to control this journey. You've got to let go of trying to control this maze. You've got to let go. And you've got to say yes to Jesus Christ. And you've got to rejoice when he gives. And you've got to worship when he takes away. Because you 
of God's friend. Because you're his son. Because you're his daughter. Because you love him and he loves you. I don't mean to say this to provoke you, but I do, you know, in love. But this is not hard. This is very easy. This isn't hard. It's very easy. God's desire for you and myself is that we would walk uprightly with Him, accepting His perfect will as if it is He that is the author and finisher of our faith. And sometimes when the Lord turns a page in our life, we're like, and now you can write this, Lord. <laughs> and the Lord's saying, um, who's the author? Who's the author and the finisher of our faith? And you're like, it's you, Lord. And He's like, you're like, just don't write this, Lord. And He's like, I'm writing exactly that. Is it because he's cruel? No, it's because he says, yes, you're afraid of that? We're going to overcome that very thing. And then a giant dragon. And you're like, no, Lord, don't write the giant dragon because I'm going to have to face it. The Lord's like, yes, you are. Because I'm your God. And you're my friend. I'm your father and you're my son. You're my daughter. He tells us how it works, but we still have trouble believing it because we see other things, right? Things are tied to things. It's like, I don't think the Lord was anticipating there's a person tied to that, and that person doesn't like me. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, there's something about this maze. Like, I, you know, I thought there would, might be like things like, you know, up and down, up and down. Then I realized the person who hates me, they actually have the switch to the up and down. They're definitely, this is definitely not going to work. And they know who I am, so they know my timing. So they're just, it's just gonna, I'm just gonna be doomed. <laughs> yes. You have no other chance of making it except for leaning on the Lord your God. I'm speaking to your heart now. It's time for you to trust in God. It's time for you to have God be your friend. It's time for you to release your worries and your, the things that are on your mind right now. Just let, let them go to the Lord and say, it's really easy to be in this maze. What are you saying I should do, Lord? You're supposed to go towards the dead end. Okay, Lord, I'm going to walk toward the dead end. You just start walking. <laughs> it's very easy. Just listen. Just obey. I don't understand how this ends, Lord, but you already know there's a dead end there and you're saying, go over there. The Lord's like, it's a dead end for others, not for you. A rich man cannot inherit. You're going to make it through. I have a secret doorway and before you go through, I have a little food for you as well. And some water. I have everything that you need already planned out for you. You can't see it right now because all you see is that big sign right in front of you saying, don't go this way, dead end, no crossing. Every sign saying, don't do this. <laughs> Trust God. Trust God. Be a friend of God. Amen. Let's pray together.
Father, we love you today. We love you so much. Thank you for what you are doing in the hearts of your people. You have been good to your people. You are a good God. You are a God of love. You are a God of great mercy. And Lord, we come to you today asking you to please forgive us, Lord, for where we have failed to believe you and to listen to your voice and meet the measure that you have measured out to us. And Lord, we say that in repentance and in revenge of disobedience, Lord, we will do the very things that you are saying. Lord, please give your people wisdom. Those who are earnestly with a pure heart crying out right now, Lord, even on this stream, crying out for wisdom, saying, I desire to know you, Lord. I pray that, Lord, no matter how hard the situation is, no matter how difficult the situation may seem, you are answering now. Lord, not to take the problem away, but to cause us to face it, having full faith that you will deliver us, knowing that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Father, we trust you. We desire to be your friend, Lord. In this life, there's not anything else that we're after. There's not this desire fulfilled, Lord, that we're going to have on earth. It's not go that's not going to be a fleeting moment, Lord. Every moment here on earth is a fleeting moment that's going to pass away, but Lord, to dwell with you in your house forevermore. is our heart's desire. We fear your name, Lord. We fear you. We listen to you. We hearken unto you. We obey your voice so that we might be your people. Lord, we know that we, you don't give us correction for our sake, but you, you give us correction for our good that we could actually make it through the maze that we can make it through the tests, the trials, the tribulations. You give us correction. we might know you, Lord, and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. We will hearken unto you, Lord. We will listen to your voice to do what you say, Lord, because we trust you.
Thank you, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. We trust you. We trust you, Lord.
Don't never let me be ashamed. Don't never let me be ashamed. Don't never let me be ashamed. Ooh, 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 yeah.
From the voice of my father No, I will not hearken To the voice of another And I won't turn aside From the voice of my father No, no, I will not hearken To the voice of another you say Father, we humble ourselves before you, saying, Lord, your ways are right. Your ways are perfect. Whatever you desire, we say yes to, Lord, to your will. Yes to your will. 